The United States had no vested interest in the Second World War until December 7, 1941. This day and the effect it had on their everyday lives lives vividly in the memories of Americans. I remember when World War II started. It was December the 7th. It was a sandstorm in Sweetwater. I was eight or nine years old. I was playing with neighbor's friends, and my grandmother called me in because the news had come on that Pearl Harbor had been bombed. Of course, we knew all the young men that had left town go, and uh, there was a man that was my next door neighbor later on that was at uh, was in the bombing. He was a prisoner of war in Japan the whole time the war was going on. I, I was in World War II, and I did not ever engage in combat. But it didn't mean, it doesn't mean that I didn't see a loss of life because boys were getting killed all the time, you get that many together. I was married in um, 33, 1933, and uh, we, had, we had one son that was, he, he lived through the war. <laughs> And uh, really, my husband was a farmer. And you know, the, the way they got these boys, they, they was drafted. And you, you went whether you <laughs> was ready or not. So when he, come, when he got his notice uh, for a draft, he went to the board or whatever they had. And, um, they asked him all these questions about what he'd done at the farm. And they told him, said, you stay at home. You, you're, what you're doing is very important for the Army. I was in college at the time, and uh, there weren't many boys in school in Abilene. And uh, so I, I had a good time. <laughs> As long as there's some boys, you had a good time. Well, there were. I was very active in my church, and we had we entertained the soldiers there on Sunday nights before or after church services, and um, it, it, some good family friends that my family kept up with for years after that, after the war was over, and they went back home. We would always invite some of the soldiers to go home with us and have cake. Mother always had a cake for that weekend, and they'd have cake and coffee, and they seemed to appreciate it because it was home to, you know, it, it reminded them of home. I took my, I started out at Fort Sam Houston, San Antonio and they shipped me from there to Camp Walters at Mineral Wells and they shipped me from there to Seoul, Korea. They had several generations of Japanese in Korea that were born there and it was the only country they knew. And our mission was to go in and find all of them and return them to Japan. Well, it was relatively easy for me because I was sent to school and spoke the Korean language and all I had to do was to ask them who, what they were and if they answered me in Japanese I knew that they weren't Korean. Most of them were bilingual and most of the Koreans were bilingual but they had, a, had an accent but it was different over there because they were working for them. The Japanese created a vast industry, industrialized the country, making all kinds of products. And there were factories as far as you could see that the Japanese had put in there. And the Koreans did all most of the work and the Japanese were supervisors. 
I got a letter about once a week, and they uh, photographed all of them. You didn't get the letter he wrote. It was a photographed copy, a little copy, but you could read it, and I, I assured him that he got them, but I don't think everybody did. But he was working in a position where he got the mail, and uh, so we did that wrote all the time and he told about things that happened to him while he was in the army and down there he said that when they were uh, stationed in uh, France that the families that lived around where they lived would take one of the boys and soldier boys into their home and every time they had a uh, birthday or some kind of celebration they'd invite them to come and eat with them and so they learned to uh, be with those people that lived in France, and they were real nice to them. And they just kind of adopted them as long as they were there, and they could do whatever the rest of the family did. And uh, he had picture. He had a whole album of pictures that he had taken when he got home. He made an album, and most of them were the people he worked with, the soldiers, and, then, and of course I didn't know them, but they meant a whole lot to him. So you were teaching during the whole yeah, time? Yeah, I, was, I taught all through that, and uh, I had about 30 kids in the room, and if you think that doesn't keep you hopping, <laughs> three grades. <laughs> something you talked about every day in school? Was it mentioned every day? It was mentioned in school quite frequently, not necessarily daily, but it was in your home daily, discussed in your home by your family. And and like I went to the movie every Sunday afternoon and I saw those newsreels. And so to me, it was a real thing. I, I did not feel like that it was so far from me. So did you notice um, just in your everyday life anything different with like rationing? Or that rationing that was terrible. We had to have stamps to get a pair of shoes. We had to have stamps to get butter and uh, meat. Probably other things, but those were the ones that I remember. Now sugar was rationed. And... Uh, Fats. What? Fats were rationed. Fats. Butter and fats. And uh, tires for automobiles, they was restricted too. There was a lot of things that you just don't think about till it happens. Well, sugar for one thing. <laughs> <laughs> and gasoline. And shoes. <laughs> Imagine not being able to buy but two pair of shoes a year. I know. And we went to the school and signed up to get those stamps. You had to have stamps for gasoline as well. And uh, then you take those stamps and go to the store and buy the shoes that you needed. And you didn't have a lot of shoes. You had what you needed for school. I bought two pair. I bought a dark pair, a black pair to eat, wear in the winter, and a white pair to wear in the, the summer. summer. <laughs> that was it. Wow. And, uh, we had relatives in Abilene, and we did not get to go and visit and see them as frequently as we would have liked because of the rationing. Because I lived quite far from school, and usually I rode a bus, but if I needed to ride for some special event, we had to have the gas to get there. And my mother worked in town, and she had to have the gas to get to work every day. But that didn't last, and I knew it wouldn't last. So I was prepared to put up with it, but I knew it wasn't gonna be forever. We also had a victory garden. You had to, you raised vegetables, because my grandmother had done that always anyway, so it was very simple for her. And we had our own green beans, black-eyed peas, cucumbers, tomatoes, lettuce, things like that we grew ourselves. And she always would buy a box of chickens, 25 to 50 chickens, 
and you would raise those and that would be a lot of your meat that you had. And she would get out there in that backyard and wring the neck of that chicken and throw that throw it down and of course she, the head would come off and that chicken would flop around on that ground. It was that was frightening also for a child. And uh, that was what, what your meal would be. And uh, Frances Cup had a little sister several years younger than she, and she found her mother's box of chickens that she was keeping warm in the cellar. And she found her mother's canning jars up on a shelf, and she canned the baby chickens. That's the funniest story I remember from <laughs> Mom came down the next day, there were all those little chickens <laughs> in those quart jars. <laughs> well, she'd seen her mother can the peaches, can the tomatoes, can the green beans. There were the chickens, there were the jars. She was four. <laughs> I don't think I ever felt deprived during the war, the rationing. I never felt deprived because of it, except that sometimes I wanted more shoes than I had. But uh, I'm feeling deprived because of the things that we did without. No. I'm feeling frightened because of things that happened and what I heard on the, on the news, on the radio, and what I saw in the newsreels. Definitely very frightening to know that I have read relatives that were in the service and, and over there, very frightening. So, do you remember when the WASP moved in? Yes, first came the British soldiers. That's right. And the uh, field was, was named by one of our teachers here in Sweetwater. I cannot remember the lady's name. She was not one of my teachers, but she was a very highly thought of educator in this town, and I thought the name was perfect, Avenger Field. And the first people to come were the British soldiers, and they were quite unusual. And I had a friend who had an older sister who dated one of the British soldiers. The girl's mother decided to invite the young man for Sunday dinner. Well, in West Texas, you know when Sunday dinner is. But Middle of the afternoon. After church on Sunday. Yeah. When the young man came, he was from England, and he didn't come until about 7 o'clock that night. Another funny war story. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember how long they were here for? Uh, maybe a couple of years. It was not long. And then they decided that they would have the wasps, the uh, women come in. And that the main one who was in charge of that was a lady by the name of Jacqueline Cochran. I did not know her personally, but she was quite highly thought of. She brought all of those young women here, and they were to deliver the planes to the soldier, to the airmen when they were completed when they were built. And uh, that apparently was quite successful, except that when they were trying to learn to fly here, they kept flying those things into the ground. And that was very hard on a child, because then you had no television, so you listened to the radio and news flash, there's a plane that is crashing. There were many lost. I don't know how many, but that that was a very hard thing for me personally, to know that those young young women lost their lives trying to fly those planes. Do you know what the WASP are? The military. Mm -hmm. Let me they were stationed at uh, the base out here in Sweetwater, and they used the lake a lot. They had cabins out there and. The government provided them with all kinds of recreation. And one night, my daddy got a call that he had to come to the lake <clears throat> because two of those wasps had fallen in the lake and they didn't know how to swim. 
And that was such a horrible thing to me. I just had nightmares about that growing up for a long time, that those girls were, they were, I think, pretty uh, lit up. <laughs> <laughs> they were pretty wild women. And then not far from our house, maybe a mile or two to the east, one night uh, they were having exercises at uh, the base out there. And a, one of the lady flyers crashed her plane in our pasture. And all of my childhood, I had nightmares about that because she had red hair, and when her helmet went off, all those pretty red curls would show. And I just, I, I could see that for a long, long time. It's, and every time I heard a plane come over the house, it frightened me. So you had lots of connection then with the wasp that way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Did other people in town have the same connection with them? Oh, or yeah. Or similar? Yeah, everybody. The wasper, you know, they were like queens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the this, uh, community was very supportive of them. My grandmother said they were wild. I was not sure what that meant. But I was not allowed to go over to the pool if there was a contingent of wasps there or to the movie because of some of the things they did. They were quite mad crazy. And I guess as an 18 year old child, my grandmother thought I didn't need to see that. The stories of Americans on the home front are just as varied as the stories of the soldiers who went to fight the war. How long were you there for? I was over there for 12 months. I was six months in training here at Camp Walters, and I was, now I wasn't actually there that long because it took three weeks to sail over there. And we were, we sailed out of Seattle, Washington, through the Strait of Juan de Fuca, and it was just as level of the water, just as glass smooth as we went out of there. It took, took about 12 hours to go through it. And everybody was playing poker or dominoes or playing a guitar or a fiddle or something. Everybody was just celebrating and we thought it was going to be that way the whole distance. But as soon as we got out on the open ocean, we got in a giant storm and stayed in for three weeks. And that's where we lost a bunch of boys. We were about 20 of us in the forward gun turret and the waves were about 60 foot high. So the forward gun turret was right in the bow of the ship and it was rising and falling, just bottom would drop out and it dropped 60 foot. And it was like any ride at a carnival. It was sort of a thrill and so about 20 of us were up there. And I looked out across there and here all these waves 60 foot high were coming just one right after the other. And here was one giant wave way above all of it. I, I believe that thing must have been a hundred foot high. And I told the boys, I said, hang on, we're going to have a rough ride. Look what's coming. There wasn't anything to hang on to except there was a bell in front of me that they rang the time with. I caught a hold of that. And there was a linked chain about so long and another boy caught a hold of that. But the rest of it, you just had a round rail to catch. And the other boys tried to catch hold of that because there's so many in there that just a few of them could catch hold of that. When that wave hit us, the ship didn't even rise an inch. It just ran right straight to it. So of course the wave was deeper than all of us and ran over all of us. But I held on to my bell and the other old boy held on to his chain and when the salt water cleared out of our eyes, there was nobody there but us too. All the others were gone. And a lot of them landed on the lower deck, but a lot of them washed out in the ocean. And we were near the Aleutian Islands, and it was so cold till the salt water was freezing on the ship as it ran over it. And they were chopping it off all the time. 
with axes and sledgehammers. But they circled about an hour, but they never found any of those boys because that water was so cold. It just well, it was freezing when it got out of the air on the side of the ship. So I thought it wouldn't last in that, but just about 15 minutes. So we had all these boys broke up. Bones broke when they hit the lower deck. And so we, here we were at the Aleutian Islands, up there right off the coast of Alaska. And we turned south and went to Hawaii. And they let all of them off at the hospital there in Hawaii to mend the broken bones. But one day we were all in this parkas, all kind of fur stuff to keep us warm. And just in one day's time, boys were laying all over the deck with their shirts off, sunning, warmed up that quick. And we went to Hawaii, didn't let us off the boat, saw all the ships that were still sunken there in Pearl Harbor. They never had moved any of them yet. We had to weave in all in through them. And we were there one night, and next morning we headed north again and kept sailing in a storm again all the way till we got to Korea. And when we got to Korea, <clears throat> they had the world's second largest tidal rise and fall of the tides there, which was 40 feet. We, we had to go in when the tide was in to where you could get close to land or else you had to stop several miles back out from the whole country. And they put us in these little landing barges. And I remember I thought they were rough, even though these ships had been so rough, but the little barges so little, they were really rough. And I remember I had me a, a bottle of mosquito lotion in my duffel bag. And it was so rough that it broke that bottle of mosquito lotion. But anyway, we got on into Korea, and we uh, we were there for nearly a year. I guess about eleven months, because it took about a, took three months to sail over there, and took I mean three weeks to sail over there, and and took a week to sail back. So we were on the ocean for four weeks. So I had my feel of the ocean. I was sure glad I wasn't in the Navy. But while I was over there, I discovered that there was American airport there, that they had hundreds of planes that they had abandoned, just had them parked out there. And they had used them to make pictures of the enemy while they were still in combat. And so I got a bunch of that paper that you used to print photographs on, and I took it back to camp with me and set me up a photograph shop. And I made lots of money while I was over there developing pictures for the boys. Did you already know how to do that, or did no, you just teach yourself? No, I, I got one of the, the uh, Koreans to teach me there that had a photographic shop. So, and I was in the veterinary food inspection department and uh, it was my job to go through all the food that came in for our troops and make sure that wasn't any of it spoiled. And so consequently, I had the best of the food. So they had, had uh, special food for the officers and for the rest of us, it, it wasn't quite so good. But I would get the officer's food and take it in. I'd, I'd tell the guard when I was going by, he said, where are you going with that food? I said, I'm food inspector. I'm taking it home to the laboratory. I'm going to test it. I test it with my mouth. <laughs> so, so I had it, I had it pretty nice. Pretty, pretty easy job. Pretty cushy job. Had a large number of Koreans that worked under me handling that food. And so when I got back home, I decided that was such a good job being able to speak the language that, uh, and I decided that, that Russia was going to jump on us 
and sure enough they did a few years later. So I went to college and I studied Russian in college, so I wanted another cushy job like I had with the coal in. One day they told us, says, well, the first platoon, which he was, Schubert was top non-com in that first platoon, says, y'all are going out to this place over here, and it was a little old farmhouse on a little tiny hill. And, and we see if you can learn anything about the German defenses over, over here. The Germans were several miles from us because we could look right down at them, and, and this was kind of farmland in here. And so there's nothing for the Germans, so they, they stayed, so we were some distance away here. In most places, we were a lot closer together. And uh, so Sar Sergeant Schuber was going to take the first platoon. That's about uh, thirty some odd men. And we were, so he, we went. We didn't always really doing too much. He didn't tell us too much. But we went out there one night, and we came to this little farmhouse. And there were two or three farmhouses around it. A little little uh, cone shaped mountain, that, and and the. the Buildings were up here more or less on the top or near the sides of it. And so when we got there, we, we had a 360 degree defense. Schubert had us dig in. And uh, we, we, we were there that night, the next night, and then the third night we came back to our lines. But uh, this John Clancy, who was killed right after I was wounded, and, and uh, one of my close friends, he and I were, Schubert told us where we were going to dig our foxhole, so we dug it. And, and I remember sitting up there, and there was a, a walk coming toward it of, of big stones out here. And about midnight, we had two hour, hours on, two off, you know. If two of you were in the same foxhole, somebody had to be away. And we had 360 degree, all, our, our platoon was all around this low hill, looking in every direction, not really knowing exactly where the Germans were. I didn't, at least. And so, but anyway, that night, I, I was on the south side, and, and Clancy and I was, and, and I was sleeping, and Clancy was on, uh, he was awake. He shook me and he says, I, was, I, was, I, I hear something out there. And so I listened real close. Sure enough, I could barely hear something out there. And, and, uh, and it kept coming closer to us. And finally, Clancy, he was a little Irishman from Boston. He said, I was, I was. he says, take this and throw it. And he'd already taken, a, taken a, a hand grenade and pulled a pin out of it and handed it to me. And of course, I, I, I grasped it, the, the handle was still on it, you know. But before I did that, I kind of got up out of the foxhole and, and I wanted to listen a little bit more and kind of move a little towards where that noise is coming from, but it was getting a little bit louder. And he says, I was, I was throw that thing, throw it, throw it. That hand grenade he'd hand me. And just about the time I was going to throw it, here came this. Wow! And this cow, it was a cow. They were just kind of angling, just slowly coming on, on that cobblestone, you know, that was down there. And and I and I thought, and I told, and I, I I put the pen. I said, Clancy, let me have the pen. And I put it back in there and handed it to him. And and I went back in the foxhole and went to sleep because it was Clancy's time to be awake, you know. But I often thought. I, I would have never lived that down had I thrown that f and killed a cow and got everybody up. It, it, and, and, and I thank the good Lord, all, every time I thought about it, that, that I didn't throw that thing. I had it ready to throw it. I knew something was out there, but, but they would still be laughing at me at reunions today if I had thrown that and a dead cow was laying out there in front of us. I didn't say a word to Clancy. I, 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 just, I just took the pen and put it in there, and I, I think he knew I was kind of ticked off, to say the least. And I just slid over in a foxhole and, 
and, uh, and a th thankful man. But I thought then, man, I would have been the laughing joke if I'd have thrown it. Was there anyone else in either of your families that was overseas? Or Oh, yes. I had a brother overseas. How often did you get to hear from him? Or Well, <laughs> he was a poor correspondent, but we, <laughs> we, uh, we wrote to him regularly and uh, heard from him. But um, it, it was just, as she said, it was just ordinary. Everything was geared to the war, and that's, that's what we did. Well, I, I had three, three brothers that was in the war. And there was two who went to Europe, and one, well, he first went to the Aleutian Islands. <laughs> then they sent him to the Pacific area. But they all come home. That's good. What was, the, uh, what was the feeling after the bombs were dropped? After the... Oh. Well, the, 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 atomic, the, the bombs. atomic bombs. Well... Fear, of course, of the bomb, and that we might get one back. But thankfulness, and yet regret that so many people had to be killed. There were children killed with those bombs. And to me, that was something that was so very hard to accept. That, that, that I remember a film of a bomb that was dropped and a little girl whose clothes had been burned off of her, running for her life because she had been on fire. And that was so frightening to me, to have to see children go through that, even though they were supposedly the enemy. Yeah, but they're little kids. Right. Yeah. They were kids. What did you think when you heard about... Well, I was delighted because <laughs> it meant that that our soldiers would be coming home. Yeah. yeah. I was thankful for the mother brothers that got to come home. <laughs> and, uh, well, there was this, every community had people in the, that it was in the middle of theory. Mm -hmm. I never will forget, as we came back in, we sailed under the Golden Gate. And everybody, we hadn't, the cars over there didn't have any lights on them in the truck. So it was really, and even the trains at night didn't have lights. So we had really missed seeing electric lights. And we came out of that Golden Gate, it was all lit up. And everybody, you could, you could have heard a pin drop. Everybody was looking at that in awe. And finally one old boy, he hollered out, hey, I'm back. And the whole shipload burst out laughing. And uh, we didn't even have a welcoming band or anything. It was, when we got back, the only excitement was going under the bridge. And then we, we caught our, our train and, and rode home. But the, the main thing that I missed, I guess, was ice cream. I went in the ice cream parlor and just sat down and ate ice cream till I was about to pop. <laughs> but that, <laughs> that was my contribution to the war effort. <laughs> well, those were certainly days of celebration when, when the war ended. And it meant that, that our relatives could come home that were still gone in the service and that things could eventually go back to normal. But uh, it, it, it certainly was a quite momentous occasion for all of us. And we had some real peculiar things happen. My, when my brother was sent home, they sent him to Arizona, and he had to be in a rehabilitation place before they'd let him come home. And one day we got up, and my mother said, Bill's coming home today. And Daddy said, oh, you're crazy. 
he let, he had let us know if he was, and he not coming. And she made us go down to meet the train when it came through town, along in the afternoon. And the train stopped, and Bill stepped off the train. And how she knew that, I don't know, but she knew he was coming. Aww. And we were all standing there waiting for him. Oh, that's we y'all were surprised to say the least, huh? And, uh, yeah. <laughs> And uh, he didn't come home for good, but he came for a furlough. He was still in there for a while. I did forget to ask you one thing. Were you married when you went off to war, or did you have a sweetheart? Or I had a sweetheart back home, and uh, she wrote me a Sears and Roebuck catalog every day. I was the envy of the whole camp because I got the longest letter, and nobody got one every day. So. But I didn't love I didn't love the girl, but very fond of her. But I just figured, you know, that I was due to marry her. She had been so faithful to me during the war, and uh, so I came back home a little bit uneasy about. It. I wasn't ready to get married, but I was going to ask her to marry me. And the first night we went out, well, she told me she had found somebody else. And I was so relieved that I didn't let her know it. <laughs> and I asked her, I said, why did you write me every day such a long letter? I said, that took a lot of time. I figured you were deeply in love with me. She said, oh, it, it made your dad feel so good when I'd tell about what we I'd written and what you'd written back. So I did it for him. I thought, boy, howdy, the old boys are sending me to sell me all the time, and the whole time it was for my daddy. <laughs> <laughs> it took a while for everything to kind of go back to some sense of normalcy. The soldiers came home, and they wanted everything like it had been. <laughs> and so we, we pretty much uh, acquiesced to that. Mm -hmm.